Hello to everyone. I'm Simone Brasili, and I'm a teacher of mathematics and physics at high schools. Actually, I am involved in a PhD program at a university in math and computer science. Before starting, I would like to thank Professor Andrea Capozucca and Dr. Mauro Labellarte for inviting me to present you with Dimension. I also want to express my, all my gratitude to Professor Riccardo Piergallini, uh, who introduced me to the topic of symmetry. Uh, this evening, the title of the speech is A Journey into Dimension, The Hidden Dimensions of Symmetry. Today, I have the privilege to welcome the software and sound engineer and musician, and as well as my friends, Dominic Chapman. Thank you, Simone, for the invitation to this presentation at the Fermamente Science Festival. I'm very grateful that I can join you on this journey into dimensions. Thank you, Dominic. The pleasure is all mine. So let's start with the journey, presenting the seminar roadmap. The seminar is composed of four chapters. I will present the first two chapters, Dimensions into History and Magic Doors and Mirror Symmetries. Dominic will finish the talk with the last two ones, Harmonics and Music Scales and Dimensions in Music. We start with dimensions into history. According to Euclid, a point is that which has no part. A line is breadless land, and the surface is that which has length and breadth only. A solid is that which has length, breadth, and depth. Euclid's definition shows a rudimentary theory of dimensions. He identifies an order of dimension in the sequence of a primary geometrical object, point, line, surface, solid. Aristotle, in his cosmological work on the heavens, maybe you know as the cello, shows a similar motivation in it. He is more definite, even if its tone is more metaphysical. Indeed, he claimed that one way is a line, two ways is a plan, and three ways is a body and there is no magnitude beside this. In short, Aristotelian physics did, did not include a theory of space, only a concept of place. Think of a cup sitting on a table. For Aristotle, the cup is surrounded by air, itself a substance. In his world picture, there is no such thing as empty space. There are only boundaries between one kind of substance, the cup, and another, the hair, or the table. For Aristotle, space, if you want to call it that, was merely the thin boundary between the cup and what surrounds it. Without extension, space was nothing else that could be in. Philosophers and physics challenged the Aristotelian precept about space. Artists participated in this challenge, cutting a radical side through this intellectual domain by appealing to the senses. From the 14th to 16th centuries, artists such as Giotto, Paolo Cello, and Piero della Francesca developed the technique of what came to be known as perspective, a style original termed geometric figuring. Exploring geometric principles, these painters gradually learn how to construct images of objects in three-dimensional space. In this process, they reprogrammed European minds to see space in a Euclidean fashion. Bernard Bolzano was a mathematician and a philosopher at the turn of the 18th to 19th centuries. He sought precise definition of geometrical object, 
At the present time, he wrote in 1810, there is still lacking a precise definition of the most important concept, line surface solid. In 1884, Edwin Abbott wrote the popular satirical novel Flatland, which used two-dimensional beings encountering character from the third dimension as an analogy to help readers comprehend the fourth dimension. Soon after their arrival of Flatland, the mathematician Charles Howard Hinton published A New Era of Thought in 1888, in which he advanced a method for visualizing four-dimensional figures, examining how three-dimensional objects, such as tubes, would appear to uh, two-dimensional planar beings. As you can see in the picture, the diminishing sphere leaving projection in Flatland, its cross-section being circles. A 1909 Scientific American Essay Contest entitled What is the Four Dimensions received 245 submissions for a $500 prize. Hinton was a British mathematician who published various monographs on the mathematics of a higher dimension. He was the first to use the term tesseract to describe the four-dimensional cube. By sweeping the shapes, we can visualize cubes of several dimensions. Let's try visualizing the four-dimensional equivalent of a cube, known as a tesseract by building up to it. If we begin with zero dimension, represented by a point, we can sweep it in one direction to obtain a line segment as the first dimension. When we sweep the segment in a perpendicular direction, results in the second dimension and we obtain a square. Dragging this square in a third perpendicular direction yields a cube, this is the third dimension. The next step, the difficult step, is to then extrude the cube. Likewise, we obtain a tesseract or hypercube by sweeping the cube in a fourth direction. There are many models of the hypercube, as it is difficult to image to grasp. One of the major issues of illustrating a diagram is that the representation is in a dimension so far removed from its actual dimension. Before moving to the next slide, I suggest, if you agree, Dominic, to show the trailer of the Flatland the movie, because maybe teachers and students are interested to see the film or maybe to read the book. Imagine a vast plain, a world of only two dimensions, on which triangles, squares, pentagons, and other figures live and move freely about. Configuration, Configuration makes, makes the man. man. Get to your squarical! Now! You're only a square. Thanks, brother. They know nothing of our three-dimensional world. Such a notion is, of course, absurd and furthermore, illegal. But that's all about to change. Where did you come from? I come from space. The third dimension. No, 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 no! You're not serious! Based on the beloved novel by Edwin A. Abbott. Tonight our world faces a grave threat. I can prove there is another dimension to space that is upward. That's so hard to imagine, but wouldn't that be amazing? My own infinite universe of zero dimensions! <laughs> Wonderful! We're going to be truncated! Oh, no, no, not that angle! I came to reveal the truth of the third dimension no more. Oh. Dude, you're freaking me out! 
What exactly is a dimension? Mathematics, reason, and imagination will help reveal the truth. Flatland, the movie. The third dimension is real. In this slide, we can see the introduction of the four dimension in art. Picasso was particularly struck by Poincaré's advice on how to view the four dimension, which artists considered another special dimension. If you could transport yourself into it, you would see every perspective of a scene at once. The ability to see all sides of an object simultaneously within a three-dimensional realm is not a four-dimensional act, but how to project this perspective onto canvas. And what about time? Picasso's dilemma led, of course, to cubism. In another way, just as we can unfold the faces of a cube into six squares, we can unfold the three-dimensional boundary of a tesseract to obtain eight cubes, as Salvatore Dali showcased in his 1954 painting Crucifixion or Corpus Hypercubus. This led to a natural understanding that the abstract space is in n-dimensional if there are n degrees of freedom within it or if it requires and coordinates to describe the location of a point. From this point of view, the structure of the real went from a philosophical and theological question to a pure geometrical proposition. Where painters had used mathematical tools to develop new ways of making images, now, at the dawn of the scientific revolution, Descartes discovered a new way to make images of mathematical relations in and out of themselves. In this process, he formalized the concept of a dimension and injected into our consciousness not only a new way of seeing the world, but a new tool for doing science. The way of thinking leads to another important and common for these shapes, that is the hypersphere. Almost everyone today knows what a, a Cartesian plane is, a rectangular grid marked with an X and Y axis and coordinate system. By definition, the Cartesian plane is a two-dimensional space because we need to coordinates to identify any point within it. Descartes discovered that geometric shapes and equations could be linked in this framework. Today, we know that it is an analytical geometry. Indeed, a circle with a radius of one can be described by the equation x squared plus y squared equal uh, 1. Considering the previous di diagram, it's easy to see how we can add a third axis. With an x, y, and z axis, we can describe the surface of a sphere. With the three axes, we can describe forms in three-dimensional space, and again, Every point is uniquely identified by three coordinates. It's the necessary condition of threeness that makes the space three-dimensional. What if we had a four-dimension? Let's call it P. Now we can write an equation for something I claim is a sphere sitting in a four-dimensional space, x squared, plus y squared plus z squared plus p 
squared equals 1. We can draw this object for you, yet mathematically the addition of another dimension is a legitimate move. It means that there's nothing logically inconsistent about doing so. There's no reason we can't, and we can keep on going, adding more dimension. So we can define a, a sphere in five-dimensional space with the five coordinate axes, x, y, z, p, and q. A dimensions becomes a purely symbolic concept and not necessarily linked to the material world at all. Looking again at the generation scheme of dimensions, we count the number of vertices and edges. This pattern can also be represented mathematically. The image from examining the four dimensions show a scheme to count the numbers of vertices. Each additional dimensions node can be reached by a multiple of two for each additional dimension. So, for a tesseract, the number of vertices is 16, 32 edges, and 24 faces. If we generalize the process, we obtain the number of vertices with 2 to the power of the number of dimensionalities, while the number of edges is d times 2 to the power of dimensionality minus 1. How many cubes are in a tesseract? Eight. Did you remember the number of cubes in the corpus hypercubus of Salvador Dali? Don't forget this number, because now we try to understand how to, to count this number by introducing the Hausdorff dimension. Felix Osdorf established a new definition of dimension that generation later proved essential for modern math. An intuitive way to think about the Hausdorff dimension is that if we scale or magnify a d-dimensional object in a uniform way by a factor of k, the size of the object increases by a factor of k to the power d. Suppose we scale a point, a line segment, a square, and a cube by a factor of 3. The point does not change size. The segment becomes 3 times as large, and the square becomes 9 times as large, and as well as the cube becomes 27 times as large. In the table, we can see the number of vertices, edges, faces, cubes, and higher dimensional cubes for every d-dimensional object. If we look at the binomial x plus 2 to the power 0, we obtain 1, 1 times x to the power 0. If we continue in the expansion, we have x plus 2 to the power 1, and we obtain 1 times x x to the power 1 and 1 times x to the power 0. If we continue the following steps, we have a sequence of binomial expansion as the exponential grows. We stop the sequence as at the 5 degrees. You have to look at the numbers. You can see that they are highlighted in different colors you can immediately see there is an agreement with the numbers in the table. Changing x with the 1, we obtain exactly the size of the dimensional object scaled by a factor of 3. The variable x stands for the open edges. In the next slide, I analyze this fact in more detail, showing why the coefficients of the expansion of x plus 2 to the power n produce the elements of the hypercube. For example, we see the binomial coefficients in the expression x plus 2 to the power 4 
for the tesseract, or we can say a four cube or hypercube. We express the integers as binomial coefficients indicates by the parentheses. Moreover, we see that in general, each number of the expansions gives the number of the corresponding dimensional hypercubes in the boundary of the cube. One surprising consequence of Hausdorff definition is that objects could have non-integer dimensions. For example, fractals have something called a fractal dimension, where the dimension of the object is not a whole number, like one, two, or three dimensions, but somewhere in between. In other words, the dimension of fractal is a fractional or non-integer number. If we begin with a line segment, and at each stage we remove the middle third of each segment and replace it with two segments equal in length to the removed segment. Repeating this procedure, we obtain the Koch sequence called Cox snowflake. If we study it closely, we see it contains four sections that are identical to the whole one, but are one-third the size. If we consider the first line, the size of the first line, one, the second is four-thirds, and the third is four-thirds squared, and so on. The length of each broken line in this iteration is a power of four thirds, where the power zero is the original straight line segment. When we scale one edge segment by a factor of three, its length increases four times. Using the same relationship between dimensions, and scale factor as above, we get the equation 3 to the power d equals 4. This means that the dimension of the Cox snowflake is uh, 1.26. A Romanesco broccoli is a, an example of fractals. It consists of a small cones spiraling around a larger one. The dimension of a Romanesco broccoli is 2.7. King Sang Hoon, in his abstract, gave a measure of these fractal dimensions. Thomas Benchoff is an American mathematician. He suggests that the trouble to grasp the four dimension is due to the limits of our senses. Benchoff, in fact, allege that our sensory limitation clearly hinder our ability to understand the four dimension. If our senses do not allow us to see the or feel the four dimension, it will be a difficult concept to grasp. However, there are a few device aid in the comprehension of the higher dimension. One way of understanding the hidden mystery of dimension is the unfolding realization about what seemingly sensible things we can trans transcend. This is what Charles uh, Dogson, maybe you know him better as Luke Lewis Carroll, was getting at when, in through the looking glass and what Alice found there, he had the white Queen assert her ability to believe six impossible things before breakfast. When we talk about magic doors, I recollect the images of Harry Potter or Alice walking through a mirror to another world, the mirror image world. The world is completely reflected, but Ellis dubs that the mirror world is equivalent to the real one. Indeed, the looking glass milk is not good to drink. 
The next slide shows the strange properties or mysteries of left hand or right handed object in the mirror symmetry. The hands are not superimposable. Imagine those two hands, he drew have the palms facing away from you. If you were to rotate the left hand 180 degrees, yes, it would have the same silhouette, but it would be palm up, whereas the right hand is still palm down. So no, they are not superimposable. A palm up left hand is not the same as palm down right hand. So they are not superimposed. And we can say that these objects are chiral object. If the mirror image is superimposable on the original, the structure is a chiral. If it is not, the structure is a chiral. We can say that chiral object are like these polygons. Kant proposed a famous puzzle that is related to the idea of the four dimension. If all of space were empty except for a single human end, would it make sense to say that the end was specifically a right hand? As it turned out, the answer is no. The concept of left and right are meaningless in empty space as you can see in this picture. Exploring the mirror arrangements of kaleidoscopes connects symmetry to regular polygons. If a line is reflected in two mirrors open to a certain point, one observes a regular polygon. The smaller is the angle, the larger is the number of sides of the polygons, and one can infer that when the angle approaches to zero, the polygon will approach a Euclidean circle. In this slide, we can appreciate the multiple reflections based by the mirror arrangements depending on the angle between mirrors. If it is a factor of 360 degrees, the number of reflections is finite, otherwise is countably infinite. In this beautiful image, we can see the depth created by the multiple reflections in a parallel arrangements. The mind creates depth. I can end up with a message using the words of the square in Flatland from his limited world. It is an invitation to use creativity and imagination to think outside the box and escape from every limitation as much as we can. The stage now goes to you, Dominic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Simone, for introducing us into the history of dimensions and leading us through magic doors into mirror symmetries. The music that you can hear now is from Warren Bird's record Music for Tuning Forks and the piece is called Improvisation in Two Ancient Greek Modes. Before the 20th century, tuning forks were not only used to tune musical instruments but also to explore sounds. For example, a pen can be attached to the end of a prong of a tuning fork and the tip of the pen set on a piece of paper and then if the tuning fork is hit to produce some sound and the paper is drawn with a steady speed in one direction, a waveform will be drawn on the paper. The relationships between sounds and numbers are being explored since ancient times. An example is the Greek monochord, which can be used to measure how the frequency of a string is related to its length, density and tension. A mathematically ideal version of the vibrations of the monochord string or the tuning fork is the sine wave, a sinusoidal function with input parameters frequency, amplitude, time and duration. <laughs> 
As can also be seen from the tuning fork and paper example, the frequency of a waveform is the result of dividing the speed of sound by the wavelength. If time is regarded as a dimension, the frequency of a waveform can be defined with two dimensions, time and amplitude. We, now we have just uh, seen how single frequencies are related to dimensions. And now we will look a bit into uh, combinations of frequencies, especially into harmonics and musical scales that can be produced with integer ratios. Actually, musical scales produced with integer ratios are being used since ancient times. Especially the Pythagorean tuning, uh, which is created by powers of 3 divided by 2, um, is being explored and described in early texts. And we can see here um, that actually in the scale itself, the 3 divided by 2 to the power of x is not completely used um, just how it is described in the formula. Because if we would um, take the power of 3 over 2 to x, we would get like 9 over 4. But in the scale we use 9 over 8. So there is another division by 2. This is um, being used to create a scale in one octave. So one octave is the frequency range between the ratios 1 over 1 to 2 over 1, or 1 to 2 and 2 to 4 and so on. It's actually all, only multiplying by 2. This is how we are creating octaves. Now integer ratio scales um, are not only uh, used in ancient text or were only used in ancient music, but they are also still used today. So there is still music produced with integer ratios. One example is Indian music, where we have 22 shrutis or scales in one octave. Um, the instrument we can see here is a rudra veena. It um, can produce very low sounds, or it's uh, like a low sitar sound. And there are also resonant strings um, attached to this instrument that resonate um, to the integer ratios, so which gives a um, very interesting and nice harmonic sound to this instrument. Uh, an example from the 20th century um, on, for the use of integer ratio scales is the music by Harry Parch, who also used to build his own instrument. Here we can see an illustration of a lampdoma by Albert von Timus, who explored harmonics in the 19th century. The integer ratios used in the previous musical scales are all part of an infinite integer ratio matrix, which is sometimes also called lampdoma. We, we can see how one half of the lampdoma contains the reciprocal integer ratios of the other. For example, 3 divided by 2 and 2 divided by 3. Another typical example for a scale derived from the lampdoma is the just intonation scale, which uses integer ratios based on the prime numbers 2, 3 and 5. In the 19th century, Jules Antoine Lissajou visualized patterns of waveforms with integer ratio frequency, frequencies. <coughs> One method that was used in the 19th century for visualizing these patterns uses tuning forks, mirrors and light. One tuning fork is fixed horizontally and the other vertically. The reflections of a light shining on mirrors attached to the vibra vibrating tuning forks produces two-dimensional patterns, the so-called Lissajous figures show a range of symmetries depending on the starting time of the waveforms. For example, one tuning fork can be hit first and the other at another time, a little bit later. What may be difficult to hear becomes more obvious when visualized 
the integer frequencies of the waveforms used to create the Lissajou figures show mirror, translational and rotational symmetry, and some are chiral or achiral. Now we have just seen how the combination of sounds produces two-dimensional patterns in time, which makes a total of three dimensions. Now, the scale on a keyboard or on a piano is not an integer scale. It is actually called equal temperament and it is a frequency um, multiplied by the 12th root of 2 to the power of x. So like this, 12 semitones can be produced where 2 times the 12th root of 2 to the power of 0 or to the power of 12 gives us one octave. And the tritonus, which is actually in the middle of the scale, is the square root of 2, or the 12th root of 2 to the power of 6. And in microtonal tuning, this uh, would be the sounds in between the white and the black keys of the keyboard. Um, the, um, a sense scale is being used uh, in these days, which is created with the 1200 root of 2 uh, to the power of x, where one semitone um, of the keyboard, that is uh, one key, uh, one white key and one black key and next to one another is 100 cent. Uh, now the human hearing range is uh, about 10 octaves, which is uh, from 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz. This uh, also depends a bit on the age. So it would be the 1200 uh, root of 2 to the power of 12,000 in cents. Now, this hearing range can be visualized as a spiral. And in the image here, we can see how the straight lines are the octaves of the 12, um, 12 tones of the equal temperament scale, um, all um, in the 10 octaves. So the logarithmic spiral that we can see here can also be understood as visualizing frequency, but at the same time also wavelength. For instance, if the distance from the center to the spiral is the frequency, then the higher frequency would be on the outer side from the spiral, which means we would start from, from the farthest point from the from the center and the spiral will get smaller and smaller towards the center which means the frequency gets actually lower but um, if we would use a wavelength it would be just the other way around which means like a smaller wavelength will be of higher frequency and will be at the center so it's some kind also of reciprocal as we can see in the formula again where frequency is equal to the speed of sound divided by wavelength. Now, the frequencies, of course, they can also be continuous, which gives us pitch space, which is often visualized as a three-dimensional helix, which we can see here in the image. And a chord in this helix can actually be repeated um, in the octave, which is often explained as being similar to the Penrose stairs, which were um, discovered by Roger Penrose. Now, the, the pitch helix can be seen as a combination of the spiral uh, that was introduced previously, but uh, the spiral in this spiral in this case would be continuous. Now, the effect of the Penrose stairs, which is actually an optical illusion, uh, was also, also visualized by M.C. Escher in his famous stairs painting. Now, a good question is, because we can hear how, how these musical scales or calls or chords are repeating in, in the octaves, 
Um, and this can be visualized as uh, an optical illusion. Do we also hear this illusion? And actually, what dimension is it? Is it three-dimensional or what is the dimension of an optical illusion? Now, we have just seen how pitch space is somehow compared to an optical illusion that was created by Roger Penrose and the Penrose stairs. Now, there are also illusions in sound. One example is the sound illusion created by Jean-Claude Risset in his piece Computer Suite from Little Boy. And actually, it is uh, the piece called Fall, which illustrates the dropping of an atomic bomb. And what we can hear is a continuously falling frequency, or it's uh, the illusion of a continuously falling frequency. I will play the example. Now, these tones, uh, falling tones, are called shepherd tones. Actually, they can also work the other way around and going higher and higher. So, uh, now, this illusion is not also uh, possible in frequency, but also in rhythm. So, we will now hear a so-called Risse rhythm, which appears to be uh, becoming faster and faster, but actually it doesn't. question is whether this music now has led us into new dimensions. Actually, dimensions are also uh, quite a theme in music in general. For instance, here is a record by the band The Birds from the 60s, which is called The Fifth Dimension. Of course, also dimensions are also a topic in, in the films and in the cinemas. Um, for example, in the movie uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey and there is a scene called the Stargate scene where we can hear some special sort of music which was composed by Giorgi Ligeti, a Hungarian composer and he describes his music as micro polyphony micro <clears throat> I'm sorry micro polyphony it's uh, quite a textured sound so there will not be uh, much of um, um, as you say, like melodies or, or the harmonies are quite, quite interwoven. So I will play you this uh, music, which is used uh, in the Stargate scene uh, in the 2001 Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick. And uh, maybe you can decide whether will, this will take you to the impression of entering another dimension in, uh, for instance, science fiction. <laughs> 
we will move to vibrations in time and space, acoustics. Similar to Lissajous figures, waveforms on the surface of water look almost two-dimensional on a picture. However, they are actually four-dimensional. The picture becomes clearer if we consider the movement of spherical waveforms in a three-dimensional space, which is how acoustical waveforms are modeled. Acoustic waveforms can even be used to levitate three-dimensional objects, like small styrofoam balls. Similar to the interaction of light, glass and mirrors, acoustic waveforms can be transmitted, damped, absorbed or reflected by materials. A typical example is echolocation, which is used by animals and in ships for orientation. Waveforms and their reflections in a three-dimensional room can form complex interference and resonance patterns. A model for such an interaction is the feedback formula. In the feedback formula, we can see how a variable x is fed into a system which will produce an output y. Then the output y is fed back again to the system um, which will also use x as another input again. So the two variables x and y will be added in the feedback system continuously in time and the x input is actually multiplied by a factor a and b is uh, used to um, as a factor for the var variable y so these two factors for instance could be amplitude so we will have different ratios of amplitudes for the inputs and outputs that are summed up together. Actually, this is representing feedback in, in, in rooms, um, in like acoustical rooms, and also in filters, so where we have some filtering effects like damping or um, typical sounds um, or char characteristics of sounds can be produced with filters. Now, an example for, for this is the recording I am sitting in a room by Alvin Lucier, where he uses his voice in a room, and a recording of his voice, which he will play back into the room and then re-record it again and again until the voice is nearly unrecognizable. I will play the first part um, of this recording and then a little bit of the last one so we can hear the difference between the clear voice and the feedback effect of the room. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves. So now this is only the feedback uh, or resonant part um, of the recording that we can hear now. We can uh, clearly hear that it's almost unrecognizable um, as, a, as a voice. So it's only like some rhythmic oscillations or feedbacks effects that we can hear. Now, sound sources can also move in three-dimensional space. For example, animals and means of transportation produce a Doppler effect, which is a wave which gets compressed and stretched. In, in addition, multiple sound sources can also be arranged in space like the instruments of an orchestra or a flock of birds. So we have just seen that if time is regarded as a dimension, sound in time and space is four-dimensional, with time on one coordinate and the amplitudes of sounds or waveforms on three coordinates of space. Now we have seen 
or heard a bit about acoustics in space. And now we look a bit uh, at acoustics of the musical instruments. Ernst Chlotny used a violin bow and a plate with some powder on it um, to visualize the patterns of vibrations of um, musical instruments. Uh, this produced some typical Chlotny patterns or Chlotny figures, uh, which we can see here on the left, which show some interesting symmetries also. Now, note that these are visualizations of two-dimensional patterns. So, um, actually, they, they are not as two-dimensional patterns, but the plate, of course, uh, the plate, I mean, that, that was bowed with the violin bow, is actually existing in three-dimensional space. So, Hans Jenny, uh, in, in the 20th century, applied the same technique to other materials like water and he also used powder and other materials and he called the patterns that can be created in three dimensions in this case um, cymatics the word cymatics is derived from the ancient greek word for wave which is called kuma now here we can also see the patterns of um, chlotny figures on the body of a guitar um, where it is played um, at different frequencies. So now a good question is whether these visualizations of the, the vibrations on the body or on plates are actually three-dimensional or four-dimensional. What do you think? Now we have heard about the dimensions of musical instruments and room acoustics or acoustics. Now, what about the actual sound of the instruments or what is being called timbre? Here we can see what is called a spectrogram of a recording of some piano notes. They're actually from a major chord. Uh, we can see uh, on the y-axis the frequency and on the x-axis or the horizontal axis the, um, the time actually so the, the we can see how the frequencies change in time so the different frequencies or the intensity of the frequency is visualized with color so we actually can see that we have already three dimensions here so one for the frequencies the different frequencies uh, one from the amplitudes of the frequencies and time. So the timbre of a sound is actually a combination of tones. So um, we have introduced the sine wave a little bit earlier at the beginning of the presentation. And we can actually add multiples of these sine waves or can analyze a sound whether um, some of these sine waves exist at certain frequencies and then we will get a timbre or a, or a, a spectrogram of a, of a sound. Now here is another example um, where we can see the waveform in time and the spectrogram of a recording. Actually here the, it's uh, the word Wikipedia, Wikipedia which is being recorded or was recorded actually. So um, this is called the time domain and the frequency domain, where the waveform is in the time domain and the frequency domain um, is the spectrogram of the recording. Now, we have seen that in room acoustics or acoustics in general, we are talking of four, dimension, four dimensions. Now, what um, does it mean when we will add um, a dimension for frequencies? Will this add another dimension? Do we have three spatial amplitude dimensions, one time dimension and one frequency dimension? Now, we have just seen that we maybe apply five dimensions to timbre or the sound of an instrument, perhaps. Uh, so it, it's quite debatable whether it actually is uh, five dimensional or not.
timbre. But what about sound analysis and synthesis? So in the previous slide, we have seen a spectrogram, uh, which is actually a sound analysis. But sound can also be synthesized. And here is an early example where a tuning fork is excited by um, an electromagnet. So it will, because the tuning fork is magnetic, it will start to vibrate at different intensities depending on the, on the voltage um, applied to the electromagnet. It, this is actually a device uh, that was used by Hermann von Helmholtz. Now, if the amplitude is uh, modulated of this tuning fork or another uh, waveform, we will get some patterns as we can see on the left side. So it's a rising and a lowering pattern of amplitude. Now, if we apply this to multiple um, uh, sine waves, we can actually add them up to create other waveforms. In this case, it is a um, so-called sawtooth, so, so, <clears throat> sawtooth waveform, which also uses the harmonics of integer uh, ratios at uh, different amplitudes to, uh, to um, create the waveform. I mean, it is being used here. They are being used. So now we can see that uh, adding different frequencies and applying different amplitudes to these frequencies uh, will give us certain sounds. Uh, which is visualized here. We can again see the spectrogram and the amplitudes uh, applied to these frequencies and the time domain signal uh, below the spectrogram. Now here is uh, what it sounds like. Now, uh, in addition, we can, of course, also say that we want a uh, sound of a certain duration, so that it should not continue uh, endlessly. And the, actually, the amplitudes of this time event can also be um, set with what, what is called an envelope generator in uh, sound synthesis, where we have an attack. This is uh, how how fast the amplitude rises, the decay uh, means where the amplitude actually falls to a certain level, which is called sustain. So the amplitude will be hold for some time before it will be released and will be um, completely silent afterwards. So now with all these ADSRs, um, we also could actually um, use a different axis for all of these uh, parameters. So we would have at least four more, um, for instance, dimensions. So it actually is, of course, debatable whether these are new dimensions in synthesis or not. And now also consider that there is frequency and amplitude modulation. So uh, together with the, with the acoustics in four dimensions, uh, will this be like a multiple dimensional system? Now, we have just seen how sounds can be synthesized. Now, in a similar way, shapes can also be synthesized, and even they can also be heard at the same time, which is called audification, uh, which is uh, one method of uh, audiovisualization of shapes and sounds. Now, in the first example here, we can see how waveforms are derived from a square. And actually, the distance between the center and the perimeter is being used to create these waveforms with circular motion. So the distance is being recorded um, with circular motion from the center, in a similar way as a radar is um, recording its surroundings or objects, moving objects in, in space. Now, here is an example of this method, um, which is a so-called super shape or a shape created with Yalis transformations. Now, this one is, of course, a little bit more uh, complex than the 
the square only, but it's, it was created uh, with the same method. Now another method how shapes can be visualized is when we use motion along the perimeter. Now this creates a little bit less um, curved waveforms, but more straight ones, as I mean, they have uh, more straight lines. So they're a bit like a polygonal chain. And a third method um, is when we use uh, motion on the axis, for instance, on the horizontal or vertical axis, and then record the, the distance between the axis and the perimeters of the shapes. This creates um, uh, actually a well-known square wave and a triangle wave. Now, the waveform that we see on the left, or in the image, is derived um, from, a, from a polygon with the method, uh, with the last method, the third one, so which is actually um, uh, the, um, called the angle wave, because uh, the waveform still retains the angle of a polygon in the waveform itself. And this is actually quite similar to what Simone uh, has shown you in an earlier example uh, in this presentation of mirror symmetries with uh, mirrors. So maybe this is somehow a little bit similar, but in sounds. And I will play you this audio visual example, and maybe you can decide whether you can also hear something like mirror symmetries or symmetries in sounds. Now, Simone has also introduced you to fractals with non-integer dimensions. An example for this is diffusion-limited aggregation with a dimension of roughly about 1.71. Um, in the image here, we can see a copper sulfate solution which builds a DLA cluster um, as it is put in an electrodeposition cell. Another example is lightning, or the Lichtenberg figure, where we have a high voltage dielectric breakdown within a block of plexiglass. Now, in music, we can also sonify this diffusion limited aggregation. Here is a more melodic uh, example of an uh, approach to sonifying this diffusion limited aggregation, where frequency is used on the vertical axis and the panorama or the spatiality of the sound that is like left and right um, is also used on left and right in the image. So the sounds that you can hear are produced by the, the little discs um, which are here are in orange or red and the, as soon as the blue discs that will move around randomly and will meet one of the colored discs or the uh, yellow, orange or red colored discs, they will stick to it and they will produce another sound. So we yeah, will just play this example now. have noticed that this produces more like random-like rhythms, but we can also um, use diffusion-limited aggregation to actually create rhythms, where the frequency of a sound is used to play the rhythm of the sound. So this will give us a rhythmic diffusion-limited aggregation, and they actually go quite well together.
Dominic, for your last part of our talk. We finished our journey into dimension and uh, I want to thank you all for your attention and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and somehow you got some take home messages from it. And if you would have some further questions, don't hesitate and drop us an email. You can find our email addresses at the beginning of the presentation on the first slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs>